Explore the history, relationships, expertise, and data that go into ensuring Stein growers get maximum yield potential. This is the Stein Seedcast. Here's your host, David Thompson. Hello, welcome to the Stein Seedcast. I'm your host, David Thompson, National Marketing and Sales Director for Stein Seed Company. We've got another great episode lined up with special guests, expert insights, and discussion on everything you need to know about maximizing yield potential. On today's episode, we welcome back Warren Stein, Assistant Director of Corn Research at Stein. Welcome to the podcast, Warren. Hey, thanks, David. It's good to be back. So Stein's one-of-a-kind corn breeding program is all about building better corn faster. And our winter nursery down in South America, specifically Guyana, is critical to us because it allows us to turn up to four generations per year. Warren joins us today to discuss the history of our efforts in Guyana, a little bit of history about the region, and how it helps us develop newer, better corn lines into the future. So let's get started. Well, so Warren, obviously you've been a guest on the uh, podcast before, but I always like to kind of frame things up from the start with a little bit of recap. So tell us a little bit about you and your role with Stein and your journey in Stein. Well, thanks, David. So as you mentioned, I'm Assistant Director of Corn Research, which for anybody that knows Stein well, titles don't mean a whole lot here. <laughs> right. So that doesn't, that should be taken with a grain of salt. But I work specifically on corn. I have sort of one foot in the corn research department, and then I have one foot sort of in sales and marketing. And as part of that whole uh, whatever that is, I'm also the Stein person that tends to go overseas and uh, do things like visit Guyana, uh, go to China, look at uh, you know rural test sites in China, different parts of the globe, go look at look at corn for Stein. Yep. And uh, obviously, you've been you, you've been involved in in the operation for a long, long time. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you mentioned Guyana, and that's really kind of what we're here to talk about today. So I know on a previous episode, I've had you on, and we talked about that operation and how it helps us in our corn breeding program. And I kind of wanted to get you back and talk more in detail about Guyana because I just think it's such an interesting story, not only in what we do, but it's just, you know, in and of itself, it's an interesting part of the world that most of us have no no real frame of reference to. So, so excited to have you here. So, I guess to start things off, uh, if you would, tell me a little bit about the history of, of how we ended up beginning our work in Guyana. Well, so previous to uh, 2004, 2004 is when we started uh, working down there. We'd been going to Puerto Rico and Hawaii for winter nurseries, and uh, those those were fine. But as you know, as the seed industry has sort of expanded, we've got some pretty big players in it. Land in both uh, Puerto Rico and uh, Hawaii, specifically on Molokai, the island of Molokai was where we were were at. Um, resources sort of got a little tight. Things got expensive there. There's a lot of competition for people, staff, whatever in those regions. So we found that a little difficult. Started looking for some other place to go, uh, which would maybe even be a little faster. I should mention one of the downsides for Puerto Rico is that uh, that's in the hurricane zone. Sure. You can have a winter nursery there and it can get totally wiped out. Uh, Hawaii, not so much of a problem, but once again, you've got a lot of competitors in Hawaii and things get tight and expensive. Uh, So Harry sort of started searching around the world for a place where we could have winter nurseries and maybe do more. And uh, in his travels, he came across Guyana. You know, it's about five degrees north of the equator. It's, uh, It's in South America, not Africa. I have to tell that story, point that out to people, that this is Guyana, not Ghana. Ghana is in Africa. I get a lot of confusion with yep, that. That's a great point. Um, right? Frame that up so we know where we're talking about. And for what it's worth, you know, the U.S. Postal Service, at one point, uh, we had seeds shipped to Guyana, and they sent it to Ghana, <laughs> even though it was spelled oh, no. as Guyana. <laughs> so I have to clarify that with with folks. But at any rate, so Harry traveled around and he stumbled across this place, which, you know, when you're that close to the equator there, you have good day length, you're in a tropical environment, you can grow year round. Guyana had been a, a former British colony, so uh, that was a plus two. The, the population spoke English. And so as he started looking at that, he actually came across uh, a gentleman by the name of Alex Mendez, 
The Mendez family was sort of tied into uh, John Deere dealerships uh, in Guyana. And uh, Alex Mendez had a farm, which is about 90 miles south of uh, Georgetown that Dad came out and took a look at. And uh, that looked like something we could use. And so we started down that path. Okay, great. So that was 2004, right? Yes. Okay. So... You know, just, I guess you kind of mentioned it, you know, a little bit of the history of the country, but I, I, I know you're a great student of history. So talk a little bit about Guyana as a country and, and you know, where it's come from and where it is today. Uh, well, history is uh, kind of one of my favorite things. So we're going to end up going down some pretty <laughs> deep rabbit holes uh, here. First of all, uh, as a, you know, it's a former British colony. They got their independence from Britain in 1966. And uh, so they sort of started going off uh, governing themselves. Uh, I think they struggled uh, with that for quite a while. Like you said, it was kind of a, probably a fledgling government in the, you know, 60s and 70s. Uh, and then talk a little bit more about as we move closer to today. Has the situation changed? Well, things, things have changed. You know, their number one product for quite a while was uh, it was sugar, sugar cane when the British were there. They found themselves not able to compete, believe it or not, with the U.S. in sugar production. So uh, that operation for them is increasingly wound back and down to almost nothing. But they've got uh, quite a pretty significant mineral wealth there. So they've got bauxite. Uh, We actually see on the river we're on, the Burbese River, we see uh, freighters carrying bauxite Mm -hmm. for aluminum out quite a bit. Uh, they've got some other things there. In 2015, they found out that they've got some pretty uh, significant oil reserves mm. uh, under the country. Okay. And actually, since that has been tapped into and is being developed, their economy has just really taken off and, really? Uh, and, and, and grown. And, and the socialist leanings aren't quite there so much anymore in that government. They're, they're much more uh, market economy, capitalist orientated. So, so, so some some interesting changes. Yeah. So, in earlier you mentioned the farm, right? So, yes. so we kind of have arrangements to have an operation down there at, at the farm. Wondered if you describe a little bit about that because I know it's it's not exactly the same thing as working <laughs> a farm up here, right? Yeah. So this is going to the farm, living there. Uh, it can be a real adventure. We are about ninety miles from the coast in the interior. And uh, there's paved roads for about half of the trip if you want to go over land there. And once you leave the paved roads, you're not on a gravel road. You're not on a level B service road. You're on a trail <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that, that uh, changes depending on the weather. It's all sand. And it is, it's an all-day trip uh, to drive from Georgetown out to the, out to the farm. It's, it's very isolated. But having said that, we do have an airfield out there. It's a grass uh, runway. That's generally what I've taken. So from uh, Ogla Airport, just outside of Georgetown, to the farm, that's actually 30, 40 minutes airtime in a teeny little puddle jumper plane. It's a mix of savanna and jungle where the actual farm is. The farm is right along a river, and it's kind of like, you've seen river valleys here. Everybody's sort of familiar with this. Right next to the river, you're on low ground, and then you sort of go up hills, and once you get over to the the hilltop, things change. Very often here, it's like woods uh, around the river, and then sort of prairie grassland up above. And it's similar there. Uh, We're we're talking about legitimate jungle around the river, and uh, then this sort of savanna grasslands uh, up above that. And so our operation, since we sort of straddle that, we're able to take advantage of uh, some variation in soil types there, do a few little different things there. But uh, heavy rainfall, you get so much rainfall that, you know, rainwater has got a pH of about 5.5 to 5. And uh, so the soil down there actually starts to take on that kind of pH uh, really? after a while. And with tropical rain, you know, you end up washing away all of your nutrients. So there's very little organic matter. The topsoil is very, very thin there. Uh, we've got parts of it that are essentially sand. And the pH thing becomes a problem in that you actually have some pockets of aluminum toxicity. And so you'll have a, a place maybe out in the middle of a field where everything will just, it'll just burn up, kills it. So that's, that's been 
difficult to deal with. But we found some some interesting solutions to that, and I'll circle back to that in, in a little bit. But another aspect of sort of farming there and being there is that despite being in this tropical environment, we still have to irrigate. And we've got so much sand uh, in the soil there that you can get rain two or three times a day, but still have to run water on things. It just dissipates through. It, it just it just goes right away. There are lots of trade-offs here, and one of the nice things is, uh, you know, on our breeding program, you you want to move very very quickly. Everything is about speed, and even with some sort of rainfall, rain event, even multiple times in the day, it dries up fast enough uh, on that ground that we can get out there with equipment and we can plant and do other things pretty pretty quickly. So you win some, you lose some with that. But going back to this soil fertility thing, which turns into a history story here, on this farm, we had noticed a particular field, which is uh, very close to our sort of little bungalow house that we stay in down there. Uh, this field had black soil like like here. Oh, really? It looked like it was high <laughs> organic. Seemed very, very strange to us. We couldn't figure this out. And I happened to be, as a history nut, I was looking at online history of Guyana, and I came across this map of uh, what was a Dutch colony had, had been there uh, back on the Burbese River. Um, the map was, was dated 1720, and right almost exactly where the house we were staying in there was a, a, apparently a brick kiln. Oh. And what we had figured out is they'd done so much brick production there, you know, and they'd used wood from the, the jungle, the surrounding jungle there, made a lot of ash, uh, actually made some charcoal. And this field was all black because this was, this was all this ash and, and charcoal <laughs> material from this kiln. And the interesting thing about that is the crops on that ground would always do fantastic. You never had a pH issue with them. And uh, so we figured out what this connection was and to some of our poorer ground where we had these acid problems, uh, we actually put charcoal on them and improved the soil. Uh, the charcoal, it binds with your fertilizer, binds with any lime, anything you want to apply to help your, your ground helps hold that in place, and we managed to sort of improve the fertility of the whole farm this way. So, yeah, the, the, the new idea of carbon sequestration is probably not such a new idea. It's been around for a very, very long time. Yeah, but, it, but it, you know, here was absolute proof that this thing actually works. You know, if you don't, you know, seeing is believing. Yeah. If you're skeptical of it, no, this actually, this legitimately works. And so, trying to apply that to some other parts of the farm, did you chop trees down and kind of burn th burn trees and try to get the charcoal <laughs> amendment? <laughs> not, or? not not quite. But we had charcoal brought in, and then we ground it up, okay. and uh, then sort of you know end gate distributed it, okay. and worked it back in to the to the soil, and uh, yeah, actually actually worked. Got so it. yeah, proof of concept. Yes, but. <laughs> So this, this goes back to some other interesting things. So we found out, you know, I'm looking at this map of our where this farm was, and it had actually been a Dutch sugar plantation that was established, I believe, as far back as 1621. And this uh, family, I don't know quite how you pronounce this, but the family name is spelled P-E-E-R-E. -E -E. uh, so it's like Pier. Yeah. And the plantation's name was Pier Boom. And I believe the Dutch translation of that is pear tree. Oh, really? Um, so this was the pear tree sugar plantation. Uh, I think it was initially set up as a, uh, a trading post with local Indians. We've actually got some Indian reservations both to the south and north of us. Hmm. So they lived there and they would collect some berries from a specific bush that would produce a red dye. And so the Europeans at that point in time were really interested in having this red dye. So that was the main the main money maker. And then they decided they could do things like have sugar cane there. Uh, there were other plantations that were set up. Uh, they did coffee. Believe it or not, I've seen some chocolate down mm. there. Some some okay. cocoa plants. So at any rate, this this had been this uh, plantation and that had a brick kiln. And we found out that this was actually one of the main plantations for this entire colony on the river. There were almost 100 different plantations uh, established by the Dutch down there. 
And I had it shown to me one day, not very far from our little bungalow home, there was actually a grave that was for one of these plantation workers. So the guy whose grave this was, his name was Moses Hine. Moses, you know, everybody that's really old is seems to be named <laughs> Moses or Abraham or something like that. And I was told that he was the first planter, so I think he was one of the first managers of the plantation when they started growing sugarcane there. Wow. And this grave, it's not like graves that we think of, you know, where, you know, it's a hole in the ground with uh, sort of a headstone at one end. These graves were like a huge five-foot-long slab of limestone or concrete that had been carved and engraved on and sort of set flat uh, over the grave. And his specific grave, if you can imagine this, at the top of it, it's actually got a skull and crossbones really? uh, on it, which is a little, a little creepy. But you can read it. It says he was born November 13th, 1639, and he died in 1716. I can't quite read the last part of, of what that says there. But, you know, along with that, yeah, you find bits of brick all over this place. You find what were bottles for rum, which there's a ve- they're a very funny-shaped bottle when you find these. Okay. And you find lots of church warden smoking pipes, pieces of those. Oh, really? <laughs> which is a long, you know, if people, if people aren't familiar with that, you know, it's a very, when you think of Gandalf the Wizard in Lord of the Rings, that's sort of the pipe that he would smoke. These are okay. very, very long ones with these teeny little bowl at the end, all, all clay. <laughs> so you find all this stuff down there, and I, I was really, really tickled, actually, to you know, whenever I found a, oh, a yeah. pipe or a bottle or something. But one of the things that I found out uh, over the course of doing my research is that in 1763, in March, there was a slave revolt at this plantation. This, all these plantations, the, the labor was all, it was all slaves. Between these 100 some different plantations there they had almost 5000 slaves oh wow and there were actually only about 350 to 400 non-slaves sort of european dutch folks okay. managing them and uh, you know slavery brutal you can find stories about you know people being whipped to death what we found out uh, through the course of researching this was that when the revolt started, the whole southern half of the colony came to the plantation that we were on, to the Pier Boom Plantation. Um, And that was because the main house for this plantation was brick. Uh, Nobody else had that that much brick there. And so people took refuge inside, and they were actually sort of under siege for a couple of days. And uh, while they were under siege in the house, uh, you know, the revolting slaves on the outside would do things like they'd gotten a hold of guns, they'd load them up with a, with a nail wrapped with a little bit of cotton, and when they would fire the gun off at the house, that nail would fly up onto the roof, which apparently was made of a thatch material, and the gunpowder would have set fire to that little bit of cotton, and that would go up there and... and Burn so you know tried to burn them out. Oh my gosh! Uh, so an interesting little. That's pretty ingenious, little, actually. Yes, amazingly, the structure we're in looks like a looks actually it's kind of like a little ranch style home there. It's not quite practical for living in Guyana. Okay, uh, they don't usually build things like that. But when it was constructed, the Mendez family they had the ground sort of cleared, and they told me that we came across a brick foundation in that area and they think the brick foundation was the foundation for the house for that house that all these people had been in oh man so So what an amazing you know like you said what an amazing piece of history right there on that on that farm yes and all of this happens you know prior to the start of the united states of america yes yeah i mean predates all of that yeah but the interesting thing is i wonder if maybe stein would not be in this environment, we wouldn't be there if the Dutch hadn't set that colony up. You know, a lot of the people that are are working for us down there, all the local folks, the local folks are a mix of uh, sort of African descent and Amerin Indians down there. And so some of those people have to be descended from the slaves that were actually sure. uh, at, at that plantation. And that's one of the things I was going to ask you about was, well, first of all, before I go to to the workforce. Let's talk a little bit about prior to the work that Stein started to do there. What was the Mendez family farm? I mean, what were they doing at that time just prior to coming into contact with with 
your father. Well, the Mendez family, at that specific farm, what they were trying to do was raise some cattle. Okay. And they had some fruit trees. I think there were some orange trees there. There's some cassava trees there. There were a few banana trees there. To a lot of, of local produce type stuff. I don't think they were ever able to scale up their produce production and find a decent market for that locally. So that part of what they were doing never took off. The main thing was the cattle uh, production there, okay. which which is, it is kind of difficult in that environment to have cattle because none of the native grasses, none of the native stuff down there is really nutritious for cattle and the environment gets to be really hot. Uh, so they were looking at uh, breeds of cattle that I think had a mix with uh, things from India, sure. other environments down there. So a little a little different. And they've had some sheep down there as well. But they were able to at least uh, raise cattle, take cattle over land back into Georgetown and, and, you know, have them slaughtered there and go into the meat market. I know you mentioned, we, we talked about the difficulty of just getting there kind of overland. So I imagine for that type of farm, it would that would be one challenge. Now, I know you said there's a river right there. So is some of those things, I assume, travel upriver. You talked about bauxite. There are probably other things transported upriver, maybe an easier path at times than going overland? Yes. Well, the Burbese River, where it comes out into the Atlantic, there's a town there now called New Amsterdam. And that's probably the second largest town in Guyana. But, you know, the whole country, there's maybe three quarters of a million people and not that many in okay. New Amsterdam. Okay. I don't think they thought that they could crunch the numbers and quite make that work no. to do that. Okay. But I, I actually wondered about that myself. And I do know that uh, there, is a, there had been a government sort of sponsored ag station uh, between us where we are in, in New Amsterdam called Ibini. And I think when the British had it, it was pretty significant. I think they might have had they might have had an asphalt runway, something like barracks. They did a lot of livestock breeding there, different uh, some production of animals. I know there was a dairy operation there, but most of that's uh, gone. Okay. Uh, not not there today. I haven't talked about the wildlife down there. Oh yeah, we virtually talk about, yeah. at at all. I think I mentioned that, uh, you know, the river's got piranha, um, and it surprises me, the local people that live along the river, they bathe in the river. How they get away with bathing in the river and not getting eaten alive, I don't know. Huh. But that's uh, a surprise. They've got a lot of snakes down there. They actually have the Bushmaster snake, uh, which I believe is supposed to be the most deadly snake in the entire world. Uh, we've got uh, boa constrictors down there. And I did have um, an occasion where I had a small boa constrictor come into the house. Really? Um, there was, uh, you know, for work down there, I would get up before before dawn, so it's dark when I get up. Sure. And, you know, roll out of bed, and I turn some lights on. And this one morning, I uh, walk from my bedroom into our, you know, family room, the living room. And the living room has uh, two sort of screen patio doors on the back. On one side, and I'm, I could the dawn, you know, the sun was just barely starting to peek through in the east, and this is an east-facing doorway, and I could see something silhouetted against the doorway, um, <laughs> and it's, um, you know, turned the lights on, and oh my gosh, there's a snake that has crawled under that door over the course of the, you know, last night, and. I was like, oh, heck, how am I going to get this thing out of there? I got a broom. I uh, <laughs> was able to shove it and push the door open at the same time, get that thing knocked out. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting. Critters like that, they, they want to come back to that same space. Oh. So I actually went out and I killed it. Okay. But it was a boa constrictor. And, you know, the th thought I had was, well, man, what, this, what would this have been like if I'd been laying in bed and that thing had... <laughs> crawl right. across my face. And it's funny. So that morning, I went down to the farm manager. He's a local guy. And uh, I said, oh, man, you know, this boa constrictor came in the house last night. And, you know, and I was just thinking about how awful that would have been if that had crawled across my face while I was sleeping. And his reply was, oh, yeah, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> you know, these guys, don't, they don't have any windows on their houses. So, so you're not getting any sympathy there, is no, what you're saying? No, I didn't get any sympathy. It was just kind of this nonchalant, yeah, whatever. 
But you know, they've got Jaguars down there. Oh, gee. And uh, Alex Mendez, pretty much any of the time, he is out walking around the farm. He's got a gun with him. I uh, because, can see why. Yeah, because of the, the Jaguar problem. Wow. Most of the people that I work with, they said, oh, we've got those out of this area. You shouldn't have to worry about it. Do you want Do you want to hear a really uh, pathetic story about uh, animal uh, life? Absolutely, there? yeah. So because the uh, house we stay in, you know, you've just got screens which are open all the time to get air circulation. As you can imagine, a lot of insect life down there. And at night, it does not work out good to have lights on inside the house. Oh, sure. They'd when you've just in. got these. Yeah, yeah, so they come in. And so I've pretty well had a very good discipline about, well, when the sun goes down in Guyana, that's I go to bed. There was one evening where I made an exception to that rule, and I paid for it. It was dark out. You know, it had been a late day. And uh, I decided I need to take a shower before I go to bed. And I'm thinking, okay, this I know there's going to be bugs, but what I can do is the shower room, the bathroom is it's an interior room. I'll just all the exterior lights, all the other rooms will shut those off, kind of keep the door cracked, partially shut. So there won't be much light get out of this. I can go in and take my shower. Yeah. And I, I have to add to this that at the same time, you know, uh, that, that was about the time where I started wearing glasses. So I, you know, have to take glasses off, can't see very well anymore. And I'd done something, twisted my foot a little bit. So I had a little limp at that time. So if you can imagine, there's this naked guy who leaves his glasses in a dark room next to the bed on the nightstand. <laughs> Walks into the bathroom, well, I should say limps into the bathroom, partially closes this door. That's the only light in the whole house. Goes in to take a shower. I'm washing my hair, and I'm looking at the wall in front of me, and then I can see these, these black spots. And I'm thinking, what the heck? What is that? And I turn around and look around the shower behind me into the rest of the bathroom. There's black spots everywhere. <laughs> it's like, oh, my gosh. I didn't have my glasses. I can't even see what this thing is. So I'm all wet, walk out of the shower into the main, you know, my towel was covered with black spots, don't know what they were. Walk into my bedroom, go back over, get the glasses, and I could see that it was these flying ants, and they covered, the whole bedroom was <laughs> covered with them. <laughs> no. <laughs> so then I got to go find some insect repellent, and then there was, you know, there was some insect genocide. <laughs> but there were so many of them that the next morning when I go out and look at the bedroom window where I'd sprayed, you know, here's this layer of dead black flying ants. You know, they they must have normally been attracted to something like moonlight, but there wasn't any moon that night. And so the only source of light was the light I had in the bathroom. This there. little crack in the door little was enough. In the they door said, come was on, enough here we go. <laughs> that they just swarmed into the room. Um <laughs> So oh, man. Anyway, that's my my Guyana bug adventure. <laughs> like you said, all all manner of all creatures great and small. Yes. They exist in Guyana. Yeah. So I want to kind of loop back to kind of the workforce because I guess one thing that's in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so you, we come out here and uh, you know, in the middle of uh, essentially kind of in the middle of the jungle and and we know from the work that we do here that that's it's labor intensive. There's there's it just many hands, right? And so, how does it work? How how's, has it worked getting the workforce in place to do what needs to be done just on a day to day basis? Uh, that has been quite interesting. Interestingly enough, I would tell you maybe ninety percent of the workforce down there is female. Okay, it's local women. And initially, we, we tried to keep some staff from the United States. We had a couple named Jill and Alan Shambaugh. They were from Indiana. And they would stay down there almost half the year and uh, sort of oversee that. But the local people we had sort of learned from them, and now we've got some local people mm. uh, who pretty much manage it year-round. But some, some interesting little things. You know, there's, there's really no jobs down there. Well, I'd imagine, yeah. Uh, we're out in the middle of the jungle. There's, yeah, there's nothing. And we're probably the first place that, you know, gave an opportunity for people to actually work. One of the things that some of the local men would do is is what they call cutting cabbage. 
And what that was is you'd go out into the swampy ground along the sides of the river, and uh, if you could afford some hip waders or something better than that, you would uh, sort of suit up, go out into this swamp, and then you'd find these palm trees that were maybe 10 or 15 feet tall. And the growing point at the top, you would cut that out, and that's very often you'd get a salad here at a fancy restaurant with it's called heart of palm in it. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's what it is. It's actually sort of the growing point of a palm <laughs> tree. So these guys would wade out into the water, you know, with the piranhas and the snakes and uh, who knows whatever else, looking for these trees that were about the right size. And they would have a backpack on and they would, you know, cut that out of the palm tree, shove that in the backpack and then uh, okay. move along to another spot, keep doing that. And then I think there would be a boat with a canning operation on it who would buy that from them. Okay. But this didn't pay very much. And, um, you know, that's just one of the few things that they had. Otherwise, you're kind of subsistence living. You'd maybe have a few goats, maybe a cow and a garden, and there's just not much else to do. Yeah. So then, you know, Stein shows up and uh, here's this whole new kind of potential <laughs> operation that need, needs help. And uh, like you said, producing some opportunity for some folks who maybe didn't have other opportunities. If you didn't want to wade in with the piranha, you, it, yes. you were kind of out, yeah. of out of luck, I guess. Yeah, we got we got told by Alex Mendez that we have changed the community down there. We've actually empowered women. Uh, women now are able to make money, and it gave them more say in their households and has just empowered them hmm. quite a bit. I think, you know, we're we're proud of that. Yeah. Uh, that we've been able to contribute that to that that community. So one of the other things I think is kind of fascinating when we talk about the work that's done there is here in the States, particularly in the upper Midwest Corn Belt, there's a very definite cycle to the seasons, right? There's planting season, there's harvest season, there, you know. But Guyana kind of turns <laughs> that all on its ear. Am I, am I right in saying yeah, that? Yeah. So talk a little bit about a day in the life of uh, of someone who's working that operation there. So as you can imagine in the tropics there, when you're that close to the equator, first of all, day length doesn't vary a whole heck of a lot. You're pretty close to 12 and 12, uh, 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of sunlight, maybe, maybe 45 minutes to an hour variation over the course of the year, but not much. Seasonally, not a whole heck of a lot of variation either, although they kind of have a summer like we do, and it is extremely hot. So if you go down during, you know, July and August there, you think our summers are bad. Well, theirs are, oh, really? theirs are pretty brutal. <laughs> but, but it's more of a dry season, wet season. They have two dry seasons down there, one that's kind of September, or early November. Then you have a wet cycle, and you come out of that in sort of January, February, uh, with some, some variation in there, but not, not a whole heck of a lot more than just that. Okay. to it down there. Otherwise, you know, we're plugging things in from our operation. And, and you know, you mentioned earlier, you, you said, you know, it's a winter, winter nursery for us, but we don't treat it as a winter nursery. We're actually utilizing the full four seasons, four growing cycles down there, I should say, not four seasons. So stuff is down there nonstop. Now, we have an exceptionally large crop down there that runs from mid-November into sort of February, uh, and that's because we've uh, identified all the keepers out of our breeding program uh, from this last last year, looking at all the harvest data, and so we've selected material to move forward, and we're making a lot of new hybrid combinations down there for that little three-month period of time. And that's usually when we like to send staff down to sort of help them sure. uh, manage that. So, and, and you hit on a great point, and I guess I want to kind of draw a finer point on what I think, and I guess correct me if I'm wrong, the re, the big value of this guy on operation is it's it really is in part talking about you know we always talk about good breeding involves you know speed volume and efficiency well this yeah. probably is the speed yes. part of the equation so just talk a little bit about why this helps us in our operation well you know to get a new corn line finished to get it to where we can commercialize it you've got to self pollinate that thing for eight generations and, you know, if you think about, well, if we're just doing one summer cycle and then one winter cycle in Hawaii or going to Puerto Rico for that, that's going to take you, uh, you know, four years 
uh, to get that thing completed, to yeah. get that thing finished. And uh, when you can do four generations a year, we can effectively finish that thing in, in two years, uh, have something finished and bring it into the marketplace. And being able to do that for us is just, uh, that's the whole thing. That's entirely the whole thing. I assume it's fair to say that would be difficult, if not impossible, to do in many other parts of the country or parts of the world where off-season production is happening. Y yes. You know, we some of our competitors like to go to Molokai, Hawaii, and they claim that they can get four generations out of that a, a year. But we've been there. We've done that. You really can't get four generations out of that. You can comfortably get three, but it's quite difficult to get four out of that. And as I mentioned earlier, yeah, maybe you could go to Puerto Rico and do that, but you want to be in Hurricane Alley uh, with your super yep. expensive <laughs> breeding nursery. So just no. <laughs> well, and, and I would imagine there's also, you know, one, you have the task of just being able to turn a generation of corn every 90 days, which in and of itself is a challenge. Yeah. But then it also having it on the cycle, you need to be able to get that product back to the States at a time when it makes sense, right? So turning four generations does you no good if the corn arrives in August here in the U.S. Y yes, so, yes. So it's kind of this multi-layered <laughs> kind of game of chess that you're playing here where we're turning generations, but we also have to make it fit in a cycle that makes sense for the end game, which is getting it here. Yes, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. And it is, it is, you know, having said that, yeah, you get, there's, the speed is great, but it is a difficult environment to work in. The insect pressure is extremely high, so we've got to apply a lot more pesticides than we would like, but you can't do anything about it. The disease pressure can be quite high, so once again, that's something we've got to add, you know, have some fungicides and things in play more than we would like. Fertilizers, uh, that's an issue. There's none uh, naturally produced in Guyana. So you've got to have things shipped in from other countries that gets to be very expensive. Uh, that's a problem. And then rain can be an issue down there. You can get enough rain that the pollinating process gets to be a, a, a struggle. So it's not that it's 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 not a piece of cake uh, <laughs> by any means. I was going to say, that's one thing I think is, is we've seen you, you know, talking to growers about this process, and I can see the wheels in their mind going, why on earth would you do this? This doesn't sound, mainly because I think the concept is they go, well, this doesn't sound like a high-yield environment. No. But that's not, <laughs> but, but to your point, that's not the point. The right. point isn't maximizing yield. The point is turning the generations as quickly as you possibly can, and for that, despite all those challenges, sounds like, well, it's kind of the best game in town for what you're trying to do. Yes. Yeah. For what we're trying to do, that's exactly right. So as you reflect on, you know, what is, well, it'll be almost 20 years, I guess, that yeah. we've been operating there. Are there th parts about that that have surprised you? <laughs> uh, well... Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, yeah. The, a lot of things have, have surprised me. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what I could say that that it, most of the things that have surprised me have been about myself personally. Like, what would I, what can I actually put up with? What can I handle? You know, this it, it is a test. Uh, you test yourself when you go down there because when you're out in the middle of the jungle, where you know we're operating under generator power right now. When we establish things down there. Uh, there was a little bit of solar electricity that occasionally functioned, but otherwise there, there was nothing. You know, the, our, the home we stay in right now, we keep the windows open 24 hours a day. There's no air conditioning down there. Sure. The first refrigerator we had was, it ran on kerosene. Really? Uh, that was the only way you were going to get something cold. <laughs> uh so, it's, you know, challenges like that, I, you know, you feel like you're camping uh, <laughs> out in the middle of the jungle to run a breeding program at times. And uh, I've been surprised at myself how much of that I could actually tolerate. <laughs> uh, you know, my longest stay down there uh, was about 70 days. And when I started that, I was like, well, this is, well, you know, should be very interesting. Am I going to end up like that guy in Apocalypse Now and go... <laughs> Looney, how is how is this going to work? Um, but yeah, I, despite those challenges, you know, I think there are a lot of us that 
have gone down there and looked at it with a lot of trepidation. I think everybody that comes back from that is like, oh, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it was. Uh, I can actually do that. But having said that, you know, we've invited people from some other seed companies to come down there. And, you know, they want to know, it's like, well, where's the nearest come and go, you know, if I need to get gas? <laughs> it's like, well, that's 90 miles away. Uh, you know, is there no, a McDonald's nearby? It's like, no, uh, 90 miles away. Uh, where's the hotel? There's no hotel down there. <laughs> uh, you know, things like gasoline, we have to have barrels of gasoline brought in, barrels of diesel brought in, all of your food. You know, you basically, uh, when you get down there, you get off the plane, you go to the grocery store and get everything that you're going to want for that time frame you're going to be down there because you're and you're going to be stuck with it. Yeah, what's, what's for supper is what you brought with you. Yes, <laughs> but that's, that's exactly right. So I would assume then that there's not an incredible amount of competition for land there among our competitors. Would that is, be fair to say? That's correct. There is, <laughs> there is zero. There is zero uh, competition down there. But, but again, it's, it, it, it's a fascinating place in the world, and it, it does exactly what we need it to do, and that's what I think is so interesting. And I think, again, you, you've operated there, and, and many of your team members have been there. It's just a, obviously from what we've heard, it's not for the faint of heart, but it's the work you do when you want to yeah, advanced genetics the way that we do, I guess. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, Warren, it's been a pleasure having you back on. It's This is something I want to do for a while because Guyana is such an interesting part of our Stein story, and I appreciate you coming and sharing your experiences, and, uh, and we'll have you back again soon. Great, David. Thanks. Well, that's our time for today. I'd like to thank our guests and our listeners for joining us on another episode of the Stein Seedcast. We'll be back again soon with more expert interviews and insights about all things Stein. And to never miss an episode, subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. To learn more about Stein and its elite corn and soybean genetics, visit steinseed.com. Stein has yield. <laughs>